everyone. This is James from the Controllers and Podcast brought to you by Octopart. Today we have a special guest for you. It is Ruben Walker of the company uh, African Clean Energy. Uh, they do something a little different to the other guests we've had on as operating within the clean energy space with a very specific mission. Uh, thank you for coming on the show. Really happy to have you here. Yeah, no, thanks for the invite. My pleasure. Anytime. Uh, just to start out, do you kind of want to explain a bit about the company, uh, what your objectives are and, and what the product is that you're creating? Yeah. Um, so it, it's a pretty giant problem that uh, around the world, some 3 billion people have inadequate access to energy. Um, and energy access uh, in that demographic tends to be fairly homogenous around the planet. It tends to be people want lighting. Uh, most people have a mobile phone, have you know some small electronics like radios, etc. Uh, and then there's cooking um, and potentially if it gets cold, space heating. Uh, and the, the sort of important distinction there is that, you know, whereas lighting, LED phones and, 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 and radios, you could run off a bicycle dynamo. It's, it's cooking and space heating that are actually really, really energy intensive. Uh, and so what African Clean Energy or ACE uh, manufactures and distributes is uh, this hybrid household energy system behind me. It consists of a combustion chamber sits atop a ventilator that drives air and therefore oxygen into uh, the biomass fire. So it's essentially as if you were to sort of blow into a, um, into a barbecue to get it going, but continuously. So it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. And what eventually happens is you get um, a, a conversion of the biomass into gas. So the hot gas floats to the top of the chamber and then burns off as a gas. And just like with a fossil gas flame, uh, that's a smokeless uh, and very efficient and powerful um, process. Um, because we need the ventilator, uh, the system has a lithium battery and that can then also power a couple of LED ports, uh, um, uh, which, um, USB ports, sorry, uh, which can power LEDs uh, and phone charging um, and the small electronics. Uh, and then what makes it additionally special is there's a microprocessor that sits on top of the electronics in the system and that uh, logs the usage uh, of each system. So um, when, you then, when that gets uploaded through a clever little integration we've built through the Android mobile platform, simply stated, if you have our app on your Android phone and you charge that phone with our system, uh, there's a data exchange and uh, we essentially see as if it were a virtual grid exactly how much these systems are being used. That allows us to really precisely wow. quantify what the individual impact is that each system has, which can be really significant on climate, forest protection, health, women's empowerment, um, you know, general poverty conditions. Um, and we can also, you know, operationally act upon things that we're seeing. So, for instance, if, if we see a unit being used 14 hours a day, we'll be curious and phone up and say, are you a commercial user and is there anything we can do in augmenting our offering to you through sustainable fuels, for instance? And if we see that it's only being used one hour on Sunday, we can phone up and ask, you know, it's a free country, but are you experiencing some kind of problem? Is there a product market misfit? How can we ensure that you're getting more out of this system? So the, the system, it's, you said it's right behind you? Yeah, there's a couple over here in the, in the cupboard. Like, Wow. So it, you can hold it. It's not heavy. Yeah, no, it's, it's five kilos. It's very yeah. portable. Wow. 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 Um, yeah, I, I'm really struck by this idea of, um, of an energy system that heightens our awareness of our use. And do you think the average person is aware of how much energy they use? And like, is that part of your... Um, mission or perhaps like an indirect result of your mission is for people to gain a greater awareness of how they consume energy and how they, yeah. Well, so the baseline that? conditions of our general sort of average customer tend to be that they're currently either using firewood in an open flame condition. So essentially as if they're lighting a campfire in their own living room to cook on top of which as you can probably imagine has pretty dire consequences for the air quality in the home. Uh, and that mm. and also a lot enormous. of risk. I mean, the problem of indoor, indoor air pollution kills between three and 4 million people a year. Um, mostly women and children, because they tend to be the ones that are at home when the cooking is being done. So this is 
absolutely stunning. I mean, this is just a like non-controversial WHO figure. Um, and so... <clears throat> and the death occurring from uh, the, the fumes or actual fires the death, breaking out? The majority of the death toll is related to long-term impact of breathing in smoke. So, you know, just like smoking cigarettes is really bad for you and tends to kill you after 25 years. Um, breathing in indoor air pollution from cooking in your childhood is incredibly bad for you and, and might eventually kill you or give you COPD. Um, so it's, it's mostly that, although there are actually quite a lot of deaths from things like, you know, cooking on paraffin uh, or kerosene. Uh, as James probably knows, in South Africa, that's a fairly massive cause of misery. Um, in, in tends to be in townships. You know, kerosene is incredibly dangerous, yeah. and someone's kerosene stove will fall over and set the entire neighborhood on fire. Um, yeah. And there's also some risk around, you know, monoxide poisoning, poisoning and such. Uh, but it, it, the majority of those millions of uh, premature deaths are related to the long-term effects and not the sort of short-term dangers. You mentioned that uh, you had the sort of non-controversial side of it. Is that part of why you secured EU funding? So this is a problem that's not very well known with, say, the public. Um, it's quite well known in the development sector. Unfortunately, it has a bit of a reputation of being a, a bit of a basket case in terms of investment, uh, you know, in mm. need of charity funding and such. Um, and that's unfortunate because it's, it's not actually, I, I think it's one of the uh, strongest business cases out there in, in terms of, you know, development. Uh, and this is related in part because of the, the, the individual units potential to unlock climate finance. Um, you know, mm. a household using something like wood, uh, to, to, to cook on is emitting somewhere along the lines of two to four tons of CO2 per annum. Uh, if you're using charcoal, that actually gets multiplied because the way charcoal gets made is you essentially burn six kilos of wood into one kilo of charcoal and then use that. Uh, so in terms of deforestation and, and climate impact, that's uh, it's incredibly significant. Um, but uh, so because of those impacts, it is something that occasionally you can secure some funding for. And in, in, in our case, yes, it would, we we uh, had some EU funding uh, in Southern Africa. Uh, we've had a few, I mean, a few of these, you know, that generally these kind of funding entities put out calls for a uh, proposal and, and then we, you know, you can enter and, and submit for funding. Hmm. But I would say there's not enough money uh, to address this problem properly. I mean, again, 3 billion people, roughly half a billion uh, to three quarters of a billion households around the world suffer from this incredibly dangerous problem. Right. And why do you think uh, basic heating and cooking ability like this uh, is so important to alleviate in communal poverty? It's universal. Everybody cooks. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, in terms of negative impacts on life, it's one of the biggest causes. And Again, the fact that it has such a significant climate impact as well, you know, the estimates vary slightly, but this problem causes more emissions than the airline industry. Um, so it's, it's definitely not insignificant. You, you just imagine, I mean, it's essentially half a billion smoky columns going up every single evening. Um, right. so, so, yeah, we're, we're talking literally a couple of billion tons of CO2 uh, per year, whereas you know, the, the total emissions of humanity are around 50 billion. So we're, we're talking whole percentages of that. Um, but the fact that that is the case gives, puts an enormous opportunity uh, into our hands to, to leverage the reduction of those carbon emissions, get those paid for. Um, and that helps fund the business case uh, of getting people to transition to sustainable energy. How, like... Is there um, is there any resistance in that transition, or like, do are are people willing to adopt this new kind of system? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I certainly think 
if you, it depends on who you ask, because a lot of people will say yes, and there's all kinds of sort of cultural difficulties around getting people to transition. And in part, that's true, but it's incumbent on us to actually provide people with a product that they want to use rather than just hope they'll do it for reasons of environmental protection uh, or, even, or even health. I mean, you know, our attitude is you basically need to solve for th two things. One is affordability and two is convenience. And if you can do that, nobody's going to, you know, say, no, 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 leave me my firewood and charcoal. Um, mm -hmm. The reason people use those is not that they like them, it's that they don't have any other alternatives. Yeah. I imagine there's also like a time, it... sorry, Nora. <laughs> As I said, I don't I imagine know, there's also on. a time-saving aspect to this to people who don't have to like go collect firewood anymore or actually procure charcoal and all that sort of thing, keep the fire going like all throughout the day and night. Like, it must be hugely time-saving. Enormously, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's it's if, looking for firewood is something that often falls to women and they will spend anywhere from mm. one to three hours a day or sometimes a whole day per week uh, getting that firewood. But it's actually not only in the searching for fuel, it's also in the cooking. I mean, if you want to boil five liters of water and you do it on an open campfire, it could take you anywhere up to 45 minutes, whereas on our system, it's less than 10. Wow. Wow. Could you kind of break down for, um, for the non-engineer, uh, someone who doesn't know a lot about uh, physics and how energy is uh, moves and is made can you break down the combustion technology in a very simple way so people can understand how it works yeah so general open fire is in, essentially an incomplete combustion whenever you see smoke you can basically see components of whatever you're burning uh, flying into the air and what you can do is by by driving up the uh, the temperature and the, the firepower um, through, through, through forced, uh, forced gasification, um, forced air gasification, which is what the ventilator does. Um, you eventually get to a point where suddenly there's a shortage of oxygen and what happens is a, a gasification, uh, kicks in and then you get wood gas. So your, your wood turns into wood gas and that wood gas floats the, the top of the chamber. And then you burn the wood gas and then you can get a complete combustion. Um, and that complete combustion is by virtue of being a complete combustion smokeless, which means that you don't have to breathe in all the junk that's, you know, that's flying into your home through in the form of smoke. Um, but it's also because you're basically getting the maximum amount of energy out of your fuel. It's very efficient and very powerful. Altium 365 lets you hold the fastest design reviews ever. Share your designs from anywhere and with anyone with a single click. It's easy. Leave a comment tagging your teammate and they'll instantly receive an email with a link to the design. Anyone you invite can open the design using a web browser. Using the browser interface, you're able to comment, mark up, cross probe, inspect, and more. Comments are attached directly to the project, making them viewable within Altium Designer as well as through the browser interface. Give it a try and get started with Altium 365 today. Do you think there's sort of a, an issue with renewable energy where people kind of only look at the larger scale side of things and tend to overlook the day-to-day -day usage of stuff? Because uh, I, I know people seem to always talk about, like, um, I guess massive fossil fuel usage or airlines or something like that, but they don't talk about day-to-day -day consumption. Do you think that's a problem? Yeah, I think misunderstanding about energy is an enormous problem. And I mean, it goes, it, 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 it's at all levels, I mean, including sort of policy making and even in organizations that really should know better. I mean, I won't name any names, but I once spoke to someone very senior at an, a global organization that whose raison d'etre was to basically fix energy access for people who don't yet have it. And this whole point about, you know, household energy demand for electricity is pretty modest, generally speaking, because LED lighting, phone charging and a radio doesn't consume much. And even if you're wealthier and you're starting to use TVs and fridges, that's still pretty modest compared to what you need for, for, mm. for thermal energy consumption, like cooking and, and, and heating. 
And he looked at me blankly and said, oh, I never thought about it that way. And <laughs> my response was, well, how did you get this job then? <laughs> um, but that's, you know, that's, it's, it's definitely a problem because I don't think we, you know, this problem would have this scope if there was better understanding of how yeah. straightforward it actually is and also how significant the, the negative impact. And, you know, as you well know, there is an enormous sort of uh, population growth, specifically in the demographic that still uses wood and charcoal uh, for their basic mm. energy needs. And so this is a problem that's getting exponentially worse um, because that population is also urbanizing. And in ur urbanizing in this context means that people go from, from firewood and migrate towards charcoal, which, like I said, is like mm. three or four times worse in terms of both climate and deforestation. Um, right. So it's not a problem that we've, you know, we've had at this scale for a hundred years and it'll just bumble. Up. It's like on an exponential growth curve. And I mean, I just came back from Uganda. Uganda is a very green country, but funnily enough, we have a factory in Northern Uganda, just South of uh, the city of Gulu. And about a, a mile from, from our factory stand two incredibly tall trees that have some kind of local mythical meaning. But those trees are about 50 to 60% higher than any other tree that you see in only six hour drive from, from Gulu to Kampala, the capital. And you suddenly realize, oh, wow, all the trees are gone. Everything that's here is basically either plantation wood or very, very young saplings. And yeah, that's pretty terrifying. Yeah, deforestation is is crazy. It's a huge problem. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's the same. It's the same when you travel through a lot of places in Southeast Asia. It's just those those uh, oil palms. It looks like forest, but it's not forest. It's just plantation, as far as you can see. Yeah. They'd be good for fuel, though. You could extract them and actually let it rewild again. Have you ever thought about marketing this product to, for instance, like the unhoused population in a city like Los we Angeles? We have absolutely no shortage of potential. Like, do you see it being customers. used? Yes, it would absolutely be used. I think it would be incredibly popular. I mean, we have them all. Like, they're they'd be excellent for you know if something like an earthquake strikes somewhere and all the infrastructure is gone. Mm. Uh, refugee camps. We have you know we have seven hundred users in the Changwali refugee settlements in western Uganda. I mean. There are, just in Uganda, approximately 2 million refugees for whom this is pretty much the biggest problem. And it's also one of the major causes of social unrest with local, uh, local population. You know, when a refugee settlement starts, all the trees start disappearing and people start getting really angry about that. And so that's something we could tackle. Um, <laughs> did I mention that there are half a billion households that need this thing yesterday? I mean, yeah, there's no shortage of potential customers. It, it, what's been difficult actually in this sector is just fundraising. It's just, there are so few, certainly mm -hmm. professional investors um, whose mandate covers this kind of sector. Um, you know, because obviously we operate in risky geographies and in a sector that hasn't always had a stellar return for investors. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's not the customer base I'm looking for. It's the, you know, the, the funding and the, the scale up. But yeah. just, just a thought as well, as someone who used to do multi-day hikes, uh, this would be a really great thing to be able to bring with you on something like that or camping or anything like that. So like even just recreational use, this is like a really eco-friendly way to actually be outdoors for multiple days and be able to do what you need to do. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not optimized for that because it's relatively heavy. I mean, five kilos for a camping stove is, is pretty sizable. But I mean, if you just chuck it in an RV or something like that, then... Yeah, it's perfect for that. Right. Yeah, just drive down to where you need to be, unload it with the tents, and there you go. You're done. You can just stay. Well, it's safer, too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, that, that's... Well, yeah, that would be great. Oh, but, sorry, well, that's an ahead. interesting point, because safety, of course, like I said, if you, if you knock over a kerosene stove, the kerosene runs out, catches fire, and sets basically everything on fire. Whereas this thing, the fuel is in the combustion chamber, and if you look at it, it is, I mean, it's you know, somewhere between 700 and 1,000 degrees Celsius. So it's really roaring. But the moment you knock it over, all the fuel falls out of the combustion chamber that is, you know, 
generating that power. And suddenly it's just a couple of glowing embers and it really can't set fire to much at all. You'd have to be really unlucky to catch the curtains or something like that. Um, so yeah, it's very safe in that sense. That's great for like uh, high risk fire zones. So places like uh, Australia, Southern California, that type of thing where you have those times of year where anything can set off a massive fire. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you always have to be a little bit careful with things like sparks flying out. I mean, that that mm. can still happen, especially if you've got the fire roaring hot. But yeah. So we're coming up on time here. So I just wanted to ask, uh, are there any trends that you've seen personally emerging in the renewable energy industry that have you excited? I mean, I see our sector picking up, which... You know, I, I am excited about it. I'm excited about the potential for leveraging climate finance properly. Now, this year has also seen enormous criticism of the concept of, of carbon credits, of, of carbon offsetting. Uh, and a lot of that criticism is really valid uh, because a lot of projects have just either not been robust or downright fraud adjacent. But... That doesn't mean that conceptually this isn't the most powerful tool that we have to battle climate change with. It's not any individual technology, if you ask me. It is the fact that you can attach a monetary value to an externality like a ton of CO2. Um, and so if I could just put one thought out there, it is do not throw the baby out with the bathwater on this incredibly important tool that we have. And, you know, carbon credits are incredibly powerful, but you know, they need to be robust and reliable. You need to be able to count on the fact that a ton of CO2 is really a ton of CO2. But if it is, mm. this is how we fix both the energy access problem and, and uh, uh, at least a significant percentage of the climate change we inflict on the planet. Fantastic. And for... Uh. Oh, um, yeah. One question that we are starting to ask our guests is if you imagine pre-COVID, if you w knew what you know now, like what would you do differently? That's a good question because it hit us pretty hard. Um, well, we, we got somewhat lucky in, in COVID because we were – until April of 2020, we were operating on a single factory, which was in Lesotho. And in April, we opened our second factory, which is in Cambodia. And weirdly, Cambodia re remained pretty much untouched by COVID until well into the second or third wave. Um, and so even though Lesotho went into a like, hermetic lockdown, you know, there was no people going across the border, there were no goods going across the border, that would have really knocked us out maybe permanently, uh, if we hadn't had this alternative uh, su supply from our other new factory. Um, so I would have definitely told myself to press on with the opening of that. Um, yeah, other than that, I mean, ensure you have uh, enough capital to give yourself a decent cash flow runway. Um, because mm. funding certainly became difficult in that in that period. Well, thanks again for coming on the show. It's been really fascinating talking to you. I think you all have a better understanding of the problem that you're facing and how you're trying to change that. No. Yeah, thank you for offering such insight into solutions. I feel inspired. Thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, till next time. Yeah. And for anyone listening home, just come back next time. I have another fascinating guest for you. Mm -hmm.